Hello. What's up, Steve? How are you doing? Hey, I'm good. How are you today? I'm doing very well. I'm Kevin. Nice to meet you. Welcome to I Ask No One. All right. Right on. Yeah. Where are you checking in from? L.A., Las Vegas, New York? Uh, Las Vegas is where we live now. Yeah. You and Josie doing all right through all the pandemic and whatnot? Yeah. Yeah. We just finished a uh, second leg of our tour and um, we head to Los Angeles for a couple of things and then uh, do our residency uh, at the Cosmopolitan in Vegas. Yeah. Yeah. Really exciting stuff. And welcome back to the road. That's really exciting stuff, man, yeah. especially for you. Yeah. And We'll, we'll definitely get into that. But hey, you know, cheers. It's 2021 and 40 years since, uh, if I do the math correctly, 40 years. <laughs> yeah, right. When Billy yeah, had, since or, I met him. Yeah, yeah. Since I met him. Yeah. It's a long time, man. All right. It's kind of unheard of in my business. That's, you know, yeah. I don't know. You know, when we met, we didn't go, yeah, we're going to work together for the next 40. You know, you don't plan these things. Right, you know, right. That is, that is just so awesome, man. And I like to start off with a little musical fact of the day on these things. And um, words out that you like Jimi Hendrix. And Jimi Hendrix on this day, October the 1st in 1970, he was buried at uh, Greenwood Cemetery in Seattle. And right, yeah, yeah. I actually went to, um, <clears throat> they moved his body, but uh, I went to, uh, were, he was buried in a pretty uh, nondescript uh, a site in Renton where he grew up. Then they eventually moved him to a more fancy thing. But I did event. I did actually go see his his original um, resting place. Did you? Yeah. And how yeah. was that? Is I'm sure he's got a bunch of you know picks and and different things around there, huh? It was it it was like the dead of winter. I was there for somebody's wedding, and I said, and they said, oh, the wedding's in Renton. I said. It's now where Jimi Hendrix is from. They said, oh, yeah, he's just down the street in the, you know, that cemetery down. Um, so it's brutally cold. But at that time, you know, not many people, I think, knew where he was actually buried because he was, he was buried next to his mom and uh, I think maybe his grandma or something. But it was pretty nondescript for compared to what it is now. You know, he's, there's, there's a whole thing for him. So Right. Yeah, you're, you're just checking in here to Buffalo, New York. There's a cemetery right around here called Forest Lawn. And yeah. um, uh, Rick James is, yeah. just, is just, you know, buried over there. So it's like, hey, what's up? You know? <laughs> yeah, uh, you, get some, you get some cold winters up there. We sure do. We sure yeah. do. You're from, yeah. you're not, you're from Far Rockaway, right? Yeah, yeah. But I had, rel I had relatives that lived up in Albany. So I'd go, uh, wintertime, I'd go uh, skiing with them, actually, yeah. Oh, really? It's okay. Brutally cold, though. <laughs> Does Steve Stevens still hit the slopes, go skiing? Oh, God, no. No? no? God, Hell no. no. No, you know what? A um, <clears throat> number of years ago, I fractured my wrist on the road, and uh, I never want to go through that kind of, that again, you know, I, I right. stayed on the road and um, uh, played played with a cast. Luckily, it was my right hand, which isn't as crucial, uh, but it kind of made me rethink, you know, I was like, wow, man, you know, if I lose, a, you know, if I break, break an arm or a leg or something, you know, it's, uh, plus my wife won't let me, you know, and uh, I just bought a circular saw. She goes, you're not using that thing. Yeah. Oh, shit. I go, yeah, I got to cut up some stuff, you know, we're in a new house and I got to cut it. She goes, no, 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 you're not doing that. I was like, all right. Yeah, that's, that's your livelihood right here. Well, it is. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Right. Well, I, I just, I'm curious. I mean, I know the hits by Hendrix. Are there any songs that really um, that you're inspired by that maybe not too many people know about by Hendrix experience? Oh, man. I mean, I think for guitar players, there's at least one point in your life where you where you go on a Hendrix binge, you know, yeah. <laughs> and I've done I've done that probably 12, 12 or 15 times. And um, I sort of devoured the. Uh, the, the books and the, you know, biography, it, you know, for me, it's, he's an anomaly because he wasn't, you know, I mean, many people consider him the greatest guitar player that ever lived, but yeah, he was really um, more than a guitar player. You know, obviously he was a writer and a singer. And, um, you know, for me, it's amazing that he went from being this kind of blues side man and then hanging out in the Greenwich Village scene. And then suddenly he goes to England and creates something that never, 
I mean, when 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 uh, experience uh, record hit, nothing like that existed before. People were not doing those kind of things with guitar, and of course. You know, he was the ultimate showman and everything, but that I understood because he got that from all the playing the Chitlin circuit and playing with all the, you know, if you're in a band with Little Richard, you you know, some of that showmanship's going to rub off. Um, but uh, I, I believe that, uh, that Jimmy was gifted with something, you know, beyond what we can even comprehend. I don't even think he understood where he was channeling this. I mean, a lot of it was, you know, LSD and, you know, <laughs> certainly uh, certainly helped expand his mind. I'm not advocating for people to drop acid, but <laughs> right. I will say that without his trips, that music would not exist. So, yeah. Uh, probably, but, um, yeah. yeah, but I mean, he's, um, he's uh, you know, the further you d dig into what he did and what he created and what he was about and the kind of person he was and, um, you know, I just admire him, and I think, uh, well, you know, certainly in my lifetime, I'll never see another, uh, uh, you know, guitarist like Jimi Hendrix. We've got Steve Stevens here, uh, Steve Bruce Schneider, but named Steve Stevens by Sylvain Sylvain New York Dolls. Did I did I get That's that correct? Right. Yeah, yeah, right. um, and uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I kind of was like. My my band previous to Billy Idol uh, had a rehearsal studio in it. We lived in a big music building of like ten stories of lots of musicians in and out and working there. And, um, and Sylvain came by, and we were my <clears throat> my uh, my family. You know, when they uh, when they um, my my dad's side of the family landed at Ellis Island as uh, Russian immigrants. Um, Schneider is not. They couldn't even pronounce the, the the actual family name, so Schneider is German. I'm not German, and um, it just they just said yeah yeah whatever you know they were just happy to be in the country. So um, when I was trying to think of a you know a stage name, I didn't think Schneider was very good. Plus it, you know it was uh, it, you know my dad said I don't care you know because I said Dad do you do you mind if I change my last name? He goes, I don't care. It's not. Even the real family name. So Sylvain, Sylvain happened to be over uh, one afternoon and we're having this discussion. What, what's my name going to be? And he said, well, just use your first name twice. And I said, well, that's when a New York doll says, this is your stage name. You know, I said, uh, good enough for me, you know, so um, it stuck. Yeah, it worked out damn well, man. And, you know, we're talking about New York City here. Uh, today, uh, Saints of Newark, I'm not sure if you're a Sopranos fan, but Saints of Newark, the prequel, is coming out today. Oh, and, right. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. And today's quote is actually one of my favorites from the series. I actually just finished watching it for my first time. And it's an Ojibwe saying uh, in one of the later episodes. Sometimes I go about in pity for myself and all the while a great wind carries me across the sky. Oh yeah, yeah. It's it such a brilliant series and the acting. Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah. and um, I, I just love I love Stephen Van Zandt in it because yeah. he's so different than than the rock and roll Stephen Van Zandt. But but uh, his character is so brilliant. He must he must have had a ball playing that character. I mean, I'd love to <laughs> be able to play a you know like a mob guy or something yeah. so, and he's brilliant at it and now obviously oh, all like this yeah, no, right? it's great in the, the hair piece ah oh, the whole thing is just so brilliant <laughs> you um, jammed with him before no i actually when i lived in i've never played with him when i lived in new york he came over for a barbecue oh, cool. um, um but um i did see him when he had disciples of soul i went to see them and um and obviously you know he's an, uh, you know another guy who's has a long partnership with with uh springsteen you know i think they they last they're 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 ahead of me and billy but um you know it's uh he kind of gets it he he's he's a great he's a great foil and that's uh um something i i ascribe to as well as a guitarist sure 40 year plus career pretty fucking badass michael jackson the Top Gun theme song, which we'll get to, but so uh, with by, with Billy Idol, man, you had that new EP that came out, Roadside EP, September the seventeenth, uh, this past month, now September, and I tell you, man, there's that song, Bitter Taste, yeah, and, and I got a, there's a term to Kessner a song, my buddy Jordan Kessner, we talk about it, you listen to a song, you finish the song, it's like, damn, 
Oh, I'm going to play it again. Yeah. That's, that's been the song of the week for me, man. I, I love that oh, song. Oh, great. Beautiful. Great. I mean, it was, um, you know, there's a, there's a feeling that you get when you know you have a winner, right? And it's like, you know, you can go in the studio and, and you do, you know, the way we work and most people work, they demo up their songs and they go in the studio and you hope, you hope it's going to turn out the way you hear it in your head. Um, and very often it doesn't, you know, you, records are about making concessions really, because the way that we, that I hear music, you know, a song in my head, and I'm sure Billy is the same way, um, is monumental. You know, you hear it as this amazing piece and then you go in and record and, you know, you start with the drums and you go, oh, yeah, it sounds good, you know. And it, as you layer things on top, sometimes it's not the way that you perceived it to be. When we did Rebel Yell, the album, uh, that was the fir first time I experienced hearing, hearing back what I had hoped it would sound like. And I will say with the new EP, um, it's, it's, I have that same feeling about it. You know, the songs are super well crafted. Um, Butch Walker is, the, uh, is an incredible producer, but you know, he's just a musician. He's, he's, he, you know, he gets it. He's, you never feel like you're working with a producer. You just feel like you're collaborating with another band member. And, and he happens to be one of the greatest producers. So you gotta let him run with it. So, um, but it, yeah, it's um, we're really happy with it, and um, and uh, every you know I, it's I, I very rarely after I'm done recording something or you know I don't go back and listen to it and you know I'm done with it I'm already on to the next thing and uh, with this I've gone back and I listen to the tracks and I go yeah this is really good man yeah. you know after after forty years you know there's still something we still have something to say so yeah that's a beautiful thing man and just last week I think you were in Palmer. Alaska is that is that correct? Yeah, first time in Alaska. It's how the um, hell was that, man? It's beautiful. It's absolutely yeah. astoundingly beautiful. I wish we had more time. Um, my, the drummer uh, Billy's drummer Eric and bass player Steve stayed a couple of days after to go uh, see the you know the mountains and the streams and ocean. I mean it's it's really beautiful up there. I hope to go back and when maybe I'm not working and can kind of um, explore a bit, but what, what beautiful country it is. Yeah. Yeah. I bet in Yukon territory someday would love to go up there like a cruise from Seattle up there and to see the coastline of the animals. It's, it's stunning, man. It's so massive. It's so, you know, I'm used to seeing mountains and, you know, I lived in LA and, you know, but when you see this and it's, it's untapped, you know, it's, it's just, you look across, you know, these forests and they're under the, it, it's just, it's fantastic. Yeah. I saw some pictures. Yeah. You had the mountains in the back with snow capped mountains and you're jamming along and that's, yeah, just, that's pretty I mean, cool. It's pretty that's, cool. It's gotta be the coolest thing, man. I mean, uh, being a musician, but a traveling musician, that's the biggest perk. You know, you get to travel the world and see things over all these years. Um, but with Billy Idol, we were just talking about it 40 years ago, dude. So, uh, how did you meet him? Was this uh, a friend of a friend? Um, I, the band I was in previous to work, to meeting Billy was, um, uh, we were signed to Island Records and we did a record down in the Bahamas with, uh, a, a famous producer, Jimmy Miller, who did the Rolling Stones and, uh, Plasmatics and Johnny Thunders. And, um, but the record kind of fell apart. You know, we, we didn't really know what we were doing. We didn't have tunes and, um, so Island shelved the record, but, when we got when we got back to New York, somehow <clears throat> there's a guy named Rick Alberti, and uh, and he was a partner of Bill Coin and, and at uh, Coin Management, who managed Kiss, and uh, and Rick kind of took me under his wing, and um, and uh, we had a, a discussion, and I said I think I've taken this, you know, I've I've gone as far as I can go with this band. I need, you know, I need other people that can write songs and know how to make records. Cause I didn't know a damn thing about, I, uh, about that side of it. I knew how to play guitar. That was it. <laughs> That's where it ended. Um, so I left that band and, um, eventually, uh, I got a call, uh, uh, from Billy Coyne. He said, Oh, do you know who Billy Idol is? We're managing him. He's just moved to New York. You guys should meet. And, um, you know, I knew by then I knew every 
musician in New York. So when Billy and I met, I said, look, you know, I'll help you put your, put your band together. And, uh, you know, even if I'm not the right guitar player for you, it's, uh, you know, it's, uh, you know, maybe we'll write a song together or something. You know, there was no master plan. Like you guys are going to work together for 40 years now. Um, but the more that we kind of hung out and listened to music together and, he turned me on to things and I was able to like, you know, you know, uh, it utilize some of the influences that I had because, you know, I think, um, I think it was obvious to him. He didn't want just a, 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 a punk rock guitar player. He had, he was in a punk rock band. He had moved to America. And I think where he was going with the music, you know, was going to employ more than uh, aggressive guitar. Maybe he needed somebody who listened to Motown and, you know, a little bit of this and a little bit of that. And I certainly have a vast, uh, my influences run deep from jazz to classical to electronic and, you know, everything. I, I just, you know, uh, I grew up at a time when um, there was a lot of amazing music being made. So um, so I think we, you know, we kind of found a common ground. You know, one, one of those things was... Uh, you know, he, he loved some of the New York bands that I had experienced and Lou Reed and television, Talking Heads, Blondie, and, you know, <clears throat> what what eventually became New Wave or whatever. So so um, I think we just kind of like we and we got on together. We just kind of, you know, um, I don't know, you know, our, our chemistry. Sometimes it's about chemistry. You know, you kind of you don't you can exactly. predict predict these things can't explain it right you've ex you've you've described him recently uh as quote one of the greatest singers there is and yeah. from a singer standpoint what stands out to you about his delivery um on stage and in the recording um well obviously he's you know uh, he's an incredible showman i mean the the closest he's our elvis man you know uh and he appeals to females and males, and he's that thing that guys want to be like him and girls want to screw him. You know? <laughs> it's, that's, that's been since the beginning of time. That's Sinatra or Tom Jones or Elvis or, Stage or Robert Plant, whatever, you know. Yeah. Um, but I think Billy's only gotten better. I mean, to me, his singing on this, on this record, and I'm partial you know, in my head, when I come up with something, obviously, you know, I hear I hear his voice in it. It's so ingrained in what I do musically. Um, but I just think he's uh, he sounds better today than he ever did. And, uh, you know, a lot of these like metal singers haven't haven't kept their voice because singing in that high range. I mean, for for, you know, a 30 year career is 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 really hard, man. It really, you know, it's not too many singers that can keep that going um but billy being an alto uh he's more of a crooner and we 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 call upon that and so i, th I that guy will have his voice till till the day he dies man that's never going away yeah and the amount of mornings that people will wake up such as me going to a wedding you know pop in white wedding crank that shit let's get the party started writing that song that particular timeless piece of music that'll exist forever and ever and ever did you know that was going to be a hit um, well, I knew it was damn good, you know, uh, yeah. we, we, that was on the first solo record and, uh, we, di we didn't have a single <clears throat> when we had finished recording. So our producer, Keith Forsey, uh, stuck Billy in the studio for an all nighter said, you're not leaving until you got the hit, you know, until you have the single. And, uh, by hook and by crick, he came out, you know, we, he knocked on my hotel, uh, hotel door at 9 a.m., with the you know boom box and, uh, <laughs> and put the cassette in and said I think I got I think I got one and um, it was you know that demo was pretty much what ended up on the final version you know that we didn't really have to muck about with it and um, you know that's once again you know he's a songwriter he's a he's a and he has his concepts and vision that's what I always tell tell people great songwriters come up with like mini their songs are like mini movies they start have a middle you know have peaks and valleys and um and uh and i get to uh to you know add my two cents to to that and that's what collaborating is 
just ripping, ripping, ripping. And uh, my late great buddy, Michael J. Holden, um, he passed away, uh, let's see now, uh, three years ago this weekend, October the 3rd. And his dad's a very, very big fan of yours and, and White Wedding. So hello from John Holden. Oh, hello, John. <laughs> <laughs> He'll be tuning in. Um, but man, I was just leaving Wegmans. Uh, not sure if you've ever been to Wegmans before, but it's a big grocery chain here on the yeah. East Coast. But uh, I was, I had all my beer and all the groceries all ready to go <laughs> to Louder Than Life in Kentucky. So that was a fun four day weekend. And I'm leaving Wegmans and I'm hearing you playing guitar, you know, in the grocery store. I mean, that it's, it's a cult classic. It's, it's, uh, you know, I just was engaged and, and uh, uh, congratulations. Well, thank you so much. And Ashley and I, we're going to be getting married in 2023. And I, I know when I wake up, just like all those other weddings, man, I'm going to pump up the <laughs> and do that. But, um, Duff McKagan, bassist Guns N' Roses. He has his own uh, Three Chords of the Truth show on Sirius XM. In one of his first episodes, he mentioned something that really stuck with me. And uh, Rolling Stones and Guns N' Roses, they went on a tour in 1989. I mean, imagine that just after Appetite, and I don't know what Stone's record that was, but um, Duff asked Mick Jagger, it's like, hey, Mick, do you ever get tired of playing Jumpin' Jack Flash? You know, and because at the time, Duff's like, dude, I got to play Welcome to the Jungle every night. I'm tired of that shit. And Mick told him, there are people out there that's the first time they're ever going to see you live and the last time they're ever going to see you live. Mm -hmm. So give it to them. And yeah. Is that your approach maybe with songs like White Wedding or Rebel Yell that we were just talking about? Um, well, I certainly don't get tired of playing them um, because we're, we're every, nothing is scripted with us, you know, nothing, we don't have like uh, dance moves or, you know, where we're going to be. So, and, and, and uh, we definitely keep each other, you know, keep the, ourselves on our toes because that's, you know, we love doing it. But a lot of these songs now um, have have really, you know, been in people's lives, and you know, I'll either get messages or you know, when a meet and greet, somebody will re relay a story about how uh, it was their, you know, their their husband's favorite song and he passed away or something. So a lot of these songs take on a bigger meaning. Um, it, it, you know, when they're in the public. Um, sphere and become so iconic, you know, I mean, we're blessed to have that, first of all, and second of all, uh, to still have an audience that, uh, that uh, spans generations, you know, not only people that grew up with Billy Idol, but also their kids now. And, you know, it's for some reason, and I won't question it, uh, Billy Idol is still cool to, to you know, even amongst you know, Miley Cyrus fans love Billy Idol because it's not one particular genre. And, you know, it's, um, and we purposely tried to do that with our music. You know, our blueprint growing up was the Beatles and Beatles records. <clears throat> Each song was different. You know, they'd have a ballad or an acoustic thing. And then, you know, John would have some screaming neo-political thing or, you know, Beatles records were took you on a journey. And um, and we still abide by that, and I think that's what's uh, cool about our music and why it appeals to so many people. You know what's cool too? Your hair. You've really kept your hair, and Billy <laughs> I kept his you know spiky uh, neo punk, proto punk, whatever hair you want to call it. Yeah, you, know, you guys still rock it like your kids. Uh, awesome. I don't know. You know, I mean, I grew up with you know all my heroes had great images. You know. Hendrick Zeppelin, you know, uh, you know, it's, uh, and, and even, you know, <clears throat> I remember, uh, you know, being a little kid, you know, barely knowing what a guitar was, and, you know, seeing Elvis 68 comeback special, and there's his guitar player, Scotty Moore, and they're in the leather, and, you know, I mean, you know, it, 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 playing music is a, is a, is a lifestyle, but also the, th in my mind, as a guitar player, I, I, you know, the guys that I loved were entertaining as well. They didn't just stand there and strum a couple of, you know, they, I, I get excited by the music. I can't just stand there and go, with the real, yeah. it's not going to happen for me. You know, it's <laughs> like I'm moved by it. And so I convey that to the audience and, um, 
and uh, you know that's. Uh, so I've always said that you know the best special effect that we have when we play live is the is the chemistry and the camaraderie and the and the the songs you know. Yes, yes, and we certainly feel that as an audience. You got the look, the attitude, and you really give it to them. And I think showmanship is the biggest thing in any live band. Um, but let me see here. Let's. Uh, you played with Vince Neil. You're on Vince Neil's first solo record just after Molly Crew. Were there songs that stand out to you from that experience? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, the, the, um, I mean, the record was, was, it was kind of funny for me because, you know, when I work with Billy, the guitar solos, are, we try and make them economical. We try and, you know, keep them to eight bars. It's not really about the solo, but if there is a solo, it has to reflect, you know, what's on there. And it's, you know, the, you know, it's everything is kind of you know we make pop records pop rock records or whatever but that's kind of our domain now when i was with vince you know i'd, I'd go okay 16 bars for a solo when when we're in the studio and oh man make it twice as long 32 bars okay <laughs> man i got now i gotta think about what it, nah make it longer you know <laughs> so it was a, it was a great experience because i was being asked to play as heavy as i could as I wanted to. Um, and we had a really good team to make that record. Ron Nevison was the producer and, um, and uh, Vic Fox on drums, who was great. And basically it was uh, me, Vic and, and Vince that made that record uh, as far as what you hear on it, you know. Um, and then um, the two guys from actually, uh, they were in Damn Yankees at the time, uh, Tommy Shaw and Jack Blades contributed a couple of great songs as well so um i had a blast making that record you know and i was definitely enjoying the southern california lifestyle that went with being with vince neal <laughs> you know i bet I, was, I bet yeah here comes vince right out of motley crew and the dr feelgood tour he wants to keep the party going and yep. he chose you as a lead guitarist that's pretty fucking badass and i have to ask you uh as far as tours go was that the craziest tour that you've ever been on with Vince or did you have crazier with Billy Idol? Um, well, what was cool, the initial Vince Neil tour was supporting Van Halen and uh, um, I had already made friends with Eddie and uh, so it was, it, and, and, and Eddie and I were friends with Steve Lukather from Toto. So we were like the three stooges, Steve would come out and, and hang. So that was that was great and uh, getting to watch Van Halen every night and, you know, definitely lit a fire under my ass. I'm like, yeah, well, you know, in about an hour, this guy's going to come out and shred, <laughs> you know? So, um, that was, that was really, uh, pretty great. But I will say the, the, the craziest tour was definitely the Rebel Yell tour because you took a bunch of guys that basically, you know, when that tour started, I was on two hundred fifty dollar a week salary, and then suddenly you're playing arenas and you have a you know multi platinum record, and that'll only ever happen once in my in my career to to, to for it to explode, and um, and uh, it was it was pretty gnarly, man. It was pretty crazy. Yeah, uh, were there some towns crazier than others? Well, I'm sure California is pretty rad, but. Did you come through Buffalo, New York at all? Western I'm sure. York? Yeah, I'm sure we did. I mean, we played everywhere. That that tour was about ten months in in the making, you know. And um, sure. um, yeah, I mean, it was just you know uh, the first time that we played a really big uh, venue on that tour uh, was when we got to Southern California. We played Santa Monica Civic, and. Uh, and I went, wow, <laughs> something's going on here, you know. And uh, we got a bus, started out in a van. Eventually, you get a bus, and you know. So it's pretty, pretty amazing experience. Yeah, yeah, I bet. And uh, just going back to Eddie Van Halen real quick, R.I.P. Uh, anything you could really disclose to to our viewers here about Eddie Van Halen, you know, backstage and the influence he's had on you with the guitar? Because I know he, when you have to open up for him, you, know, you got to bring that. Yeah, I mean, I mean, from the moment Ed, Ed would arrive at the at the venue, uh, the guitar never left him, you know. I mean, he, it was in his hands. It was really, in, you know, Billy and I have talked about this. We've we've had Eddie come up and play, and um, the guitar really was an extension of him. It it uh, He was the most naturally gifted 
almost blissfully unaware of what he did, you know, because he didn't have an ego about it. It was like, this is what I do. Um, and, uh, and obviously the world benefited from it, but, uh, I mean, what an innovator on it, on every, you know, and, and that's, that's a musician, you know, when you're, uh, a, an incredible guitar player and then you start thinking about developing ideas for the instrument that don't exist before and uh, a sound that did you know when that first Van Halen record came out that that no, no guitar sounded like that it was like it was like the first time Led Zeppelin came out nobody heard a rock band that sounded like that it made every other band sound puny you know Bonham's drums and the, the production and the effects and everything and the Everything about it, and uh, and Van Halen had that same same effect, and um, and I will say that uh, that Ed was a generous, sweet, uh, fun guy to be around. You know, every, every moment that I spent with him was a laugh. You know, and and, uh, and also, you know, we were so different. You know, I wasn't trying to play like him. I was from New York. Uh, and, uh, and I think he appreciated that. I was, you know, Billy Idol music and Van Halen music are polar opposites. And, um, and I think, you know, that's why we, we, we had fun together because it was like, hey, man, you know, yeah, you know, and, and we grew up with the same music. You know, we talk about the first time we heard Alan Holdsworth, who's, you know, who's a huge influence on us. And, um, and Ed grew up with a lot of, say, Cream and Zeppelin and all those records you know same same thing I, I really appreciate you sharing that and while you're talking about zeppelin um anytime i have a, a badass guitarist on i ask no one steve stevens of billy idol here i like to just show this off and this should be behind glass it's not yet so uh this is signed by uh page and plant here oh wow <laughs> you know, um yeah, got yeah. a little certificate of authenticity but oh wow this is just uh, something I wanted to show off to you here because yeah. Monkey from Corn is doing the same thing. He's got a Robert Plant signed guitar and uh -huh. a Page and Plant. So. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. One and the only Led Zeppelin. But, uh, you know, if you're for our viewers, if you're finding any value in this, uh, a little like or subscribe is very much appreciated. For every subscribe, I make a little donation to the American Foundation Suicide Prevention, of which I'm on the board. So I really appreciate that. And uh, my next question to you, Steve, is, you know, who in this business have you lost to suicide and how do they motivate you to continue to move forward? Um, well, unfortunately, suicide uh, ran, ran rampant in my neighborhood. There was a, um, uh, a um, very famous protest singer. Uh, his name was Phil Oaks. And if anyone wants to look, there's a, a really good documentary about Phil. Phil was very politically active in the 60s. Uh, he was part of the Greenwich Village folk scene that gave us Bob Dylan and so many other uh, great folk singers. Um, Phil's sister was my first guitar teacher, and Phil was a hero of ours uh, because he came from far Rockaway. And um, uh, Phil uh, committed suicide. And... Um, and you know, f you know, it's. I, I think you know. I could have. I, I was probably only ten or eleven when that happened. I was already playing guitar, and how you, um, how you uh, dissolve that as a kid that young, uh, is really scary, and you don't talk. This is when you didn't talk about it. And not soon afterwards, my best friend's dad committed suicide. And we were all friends. We were all part of the same group of people. Um, and, uh, and also a guitar player, also from Far Rockaway, who was my mentor when I was the first time I ever heard a electric guitar through a Marshall amplifier. He was our local hero, a guy named John Morales. And he literally gave me his clothes off, off his back because... Uh, I had just joined a band, a cover band, and he said, oh, you got to dress like a rock star. He gave me some, some rock star clothes, you know, shirts and stuff, because he was in a band. He was a great looking guy, had a great image and everything. He committed suicide as well. Um, once again, you didn't talk about it back then. Um, but I think now having lost 
uh, Chester uh, from Lincoln Park, who uh, I, you know I had worked with a, a, on a couple of shows. I played in an all-star band occasionally, and uh, we actually toured with Chester, who was uh, an incredibly sweet and giving guy. And I just it 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 really took me by surprise because I didn't see any signs of it, but. That's that's the way it is, isn't it? You know, you don't know what's what's really going on with a person. Um, so I think it's really important to 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 reach out and talk about mental health, and um, and uh, and it shouldn't it should society should accept it just as if uh, you know you had a cold and you had to go to the doctor for uh, penicillin or something. It's it's it, these are medical medical issues and. Um, and uh, and I think um, I think if there's anything that that uh, that I can do about that, and, you know, um, and I'm always checking in on my friends. How you doing? Especially during this COVID lockdown, it's a lot of people. The isolation really messed with a lot of people's heads. So um, and it's certainly you know uh, you know it's uh, musicians. You know, we're sensitive souls most of the time, and you know, not not a lot of us are going to pick up the phone and go, you know what, man, I'm really feeling like I'm really down or whatever. So I try and check in with my friends as best I get, you know, can. Yeah, it's really really important, and uh, very kind of you to share that. John Morales forever, you know, his his influence reigns supreme, and in, in what you do with your hands and your creations. Um, depression has no face, and it really is a chemical imbalance in the brain. Yeah. Me having been diagnosed with it in 2016, being out of the woods with the decisions that I've made and how lucky I am to have Ashlyn and, um, and this podcast to connect with heroes. You know, it's just, it's really special and to uh, eliminate that stigma because there's right. nothing to be exactly. afraid it, about. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. You got a funny memory with Chester that stands out on a bus or something that he, any inside joke that you had with him? Well, my um, my wife and I have been together for we've been married nine eight, well we've been together nineteen years, and uh, and I adore her family and her brother, uh, her her older brother. When we met Chester, I said, "Who does he remind you of?" She goes, "My brother Nick," and we just they're the same age, I guess. Yeah, they're pretty much the same age. They had the same. You ever meet somebody who has the same temperament? They don't look the same, but you go, you really remind me of my friend, or you know, you're Energy. just like, yeah, yeah. And they, it's like, and we immediately loved Chester because he reminded us of of Josie, my wife's brother. Um, mm. And my best memory of Chester is he had just got this little dog. I forgot his the name. So we're playing a, uh, a club downtown LA. It's one of these all-star shows and Chester's outside to greet everyone before they go in. So he can introduce them to his dog, his new dog. <laughs> uh, and I just thought, man, that's, you know, a, it's super sweet. It's kind of funny. And, you know, Chester, he's a big rock star. I mean, you know, it was, I was just like, that's, so cool. That's what he cares about is no like, you know, where's my dressing room? Where's my this? Where's my, you know, there's no ego. It's all about check out my new, my new, my new dog, you know? <laughs> um, and, um, and one great uh, memory I have, and I, there might be a clip of it online. We had uh, Billy Duffy from the cult was playing with us and we got to do Edie, one of the great ch chow baby Edie great cult song, sort of a ballad, and Chester sang it. And um, and I got to uh, have this guitar synthesizer that can do strings and things. And, and I said to Billy Duffy, you play the guitar, man, because it's your song, but I'm going to embellish it with orchestration. And and uh, I got goosebumps every time we did that song. It's online somewhere. You should People should check out Chester singing that song. It's pretty well, amazing. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Well, he, I'll put a link of that to below. Yeah. Um, this is a little thing I had done about a year ago, uh, the Hybrid Theory, a little nod oh. to the first rock record I ever loved, and yeah. R.I.P. Chester all the yeah. way. Yeah, uh, We got Steve Stevens here of Billy Idol going back on tour here soon and very kind enough to check in with, with us on IS No One. But you worked with Michael Jackson. Uh, what's the one word to describe him in in a creative element in the in the space that you guys made music in that bad record? 
Um, wow. I mean, uh, uh, you know, able to look at music with a, with a fascination as if he had never made music. Now, this is, this is the thing that musicians forget about. And um, I had this discussion once with, with um, uh, Sharon Osbourne. And she said, uh, you know, you guitar players, you play all this weedly, weedly stuff to impress other guitar players. And that's all fine and good. She said, but really, what, what you should be doing is playing stuff that makes people want to pick up the guitar and learn how to play it because it's, uh, you know, and I, saw, and I thought back, yeah, well, that's what, uh, when I heard the Stones for the first time or the Beatles or heard Satisfaction, I remember, I want to, I want to play that instrument. I want to, I want to learn how to do that. And, um, and I think, uh, you know, that uh, Michael had that ability to look outside of the process of making music. Uh, like he said to me, um, you know, uh, you know, first of all, I, I was honored to, to, to be on the on the record and be in the studio with him and Quincy Jones. And, but Michael would describe what he wanted, you know, I mean, obviously the song is the song and the chords are the chords. And, and I listen back to it and I go, OK, I'll play this line, da, 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 you know. And he would describe what he wanted, not not obtruse like, oh, I hear it in green or, you know, he he described music as, um, I don't know, you know, high energy. I want I want like high energy here as if you're falling out of a plane or something or here. I want it to be like you're running as fast as you can. You know, he looked at music that way. And, and I've never worked with anyone else who had that kind of innocence about it and excitement about it, especially after making records since he was five years old. You, you tend to lose that, that wonderment about making records, but he never did. So um, I try and uh, try and keep that. You know, I try and forget about all the, you know, I'm sitting here in my studio with all this gear and stuff. And the last thing I want to think about is this stuff. It's just tools to, to, to get me to, to, express myself but uh, a lot of people a lot of musicians it's very easy to lose sight of that initial wonderment yeah and just to keep it simple uh did you perform with michael jackson on stage for that tour at all or um i didn't do the tour i played one show with him in new york which was a benefit for the NAACP, and uh, that was at Madison Square Garden. Wow. And how yeah. was that experience, Steve, playing with um, up on stage? Yeah, it was p pretty cool. I mean, I had, you know, I mean, the video that we did was was amazing because we were on, I was on the set on stage with the guy all day. You know, video shoots back then were really long, you know, 12-hour days. So you just get to shoot the shit with the guy, you know, like, you know, Hey, what are you listening to? Oh, what do you do? You know, it's just like a everyday thing. Yeah. Michael, what do you do? Oh, what are you going to have for lunch? Oh, you really? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, you want to meet monk, the bubbles, the monkey. Yeah. Bring the monkey in, you know, and then you go, it's Michael Jackson. You know? You know? Uh -huh. So, um, yeah, I mean, it was, um, you know, uh, it was kind of funny because I come from the rock and roll side of things. And the first thing they did at Soundcheck is the choreographer comes up to me and he's like, OK, well, you're going to be here. And, da, da, and I go, uh-uh, uh nah. -uh. I go, you see that spot right by that that guitar pedal? That's where I'll be. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm a rock and roll guy. I don't I, I, don't try and choreograph me. No twirls know. or cartwheels or anything? Yeah, you know, no, no, that's not my okay. thing, man. Yeah. All right. Gotcha. Oh, well, uh, I had a, I lived in San Diego and Los Angeles. I worked at the Hotel Bel Air, actually, Wolfgang Puck. Uh, really, really cool experience there. But I got hooked up with a fellow named Mike Ruggirello, and he is a musician in San Diego. Very, very big fan of yours. I'm not a guitar player. That's signed by Static X. You know, I, I check it. I look at that. I yeah. bash away on the drums here. But Mike had a question for you. Just finishing up here with... Uh, what are the revisions on your new amp and have you ever used a Strymon Deco? Um, I haven't used that Strymon pedal. The revisions on the amp, it's now, um, 
it's a Friedman. I have a signature amplifier with Dave Friedman and the, the changes that we made. It's two independent channels with two independent master volumes. I know this is all very technical, but uh, for guitar players, it's uh, it's it's uh, basically uh, when you go to play a solo, you can switch the channel and you can be twice as loud as you were before. <laughs> so that's basically it. It's a great amplifier. Um, but all the all the Friedman amplifiers are just brilliant, you know. Dave uh, and I have worked together, and he's he's worked with the best of the best, and as Eddie Van Halen, he worked with, and uh, and Dave's a good friend of mine. I love collaborating with him, um, and uh, and I think my amplifier is the best thing that you can buy. <laughs> so there you go. Boom. That's why I that's why I play through it, you know. Yeah, and there's a link. Uh, I'm sure I'll find that link. I'll include a link below to that where they could. Right. You know check that out um well uh it's october and what's the scariest movie you ever saw um what oh man i'm really dating myself but when i saw the silent phantom of the opera when i was a kid Ooh. first first of all silent movies are creepy as hell anyway and they're black and white and i mean and uh yeah and uh lon cheney did all his own i mean you know you a horror movie nut and uh, I've read books about Lon Chaney and Man of a Thousand Faces is the, the name of the book. It's, it's a really good one. Um, he did his own makeup and stuff and uh, I mean he, 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 when he rips off that mask and uh, to me that still shit scares the bejeevous out of me but I'm sure now for kids you know Saw and all that stuff is scary but but uh, I can't I I grew up in more innocent times. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> a man of a thousand faces. I've never heard of that. Uh, yeah, it's a book, the uh, biography of Lon Chaney. Yeah. Hmm. And I got to see, um, there was a, a well-known horror magazine called Famous Monsters of Filmland. Hmm. And I had a subscription for many years when I was a kid. Well, I got to meet the founder of that magazine. And in his house, he had Lon Chaney's makeup kit, his actual original makeup kit. So... Uh, I got to see that, and uh, uh, Lon Chaney really spearheaded uh, horror makeup with using cotton and spirit gum, and um, and he was uh, he was the f at the forefront of doing that, uh, um, you know, makeup horror makeup. Yeah, uh, never heard of him either, Steve. So I'm going to look him up and and see what his work. I, I love the black and white stuff and the. Old Nosferatu oh, yeah. and yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's another creepy one. Yeah, <laughs> when that when that dude rises up out of the out of the sh the boat, man, it's, like, yeah. it's still one of those images. You go, that's still pretty creepy, man. <laughs> Have you ever seen The Sixth Sense with uh, with uh, what's his name? Uh, Die Hard, Bruce Willis. Yeah, that's the one with the kid. I see dead people. Yes, yes. Yeah, so yeah the same, you're talking about these guys with the face like. That's to me is is the the, the pale faced dude when you turn the light yeah. on in the bathroom at night and yeah. there's a guy like you know, yeah. get out of here. Ugh. Yeah, yeah. Um, but horror movies. Uh, Kirk Hammond of Metallica loves horror. The Almighty Cliff Burton was yeah. they always clicked on that and they're celebrating 40 years of being a band. Um, have you ever had any run-ins with Lars Ulrich or James Hetfield and the guys? I've never met any anyone in Metallica. It's crazy. I mean, it's just I've, we, oh. our paths have never crossed. But uh, um, you know, I think they're the, they're the this the next generation's Black Sabbath as far as as far as what they contributed and the the uh, impact and 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 uh, and um, their uniqueness and willingness to do what was not the norm and that's always the way you get a breakout that's always the way you you get the greats as people go yeah we're not going to do it the way we did it the, the way it's been done before and uh and um and uh james's riffs and i mean um uh, yeah and I, I, I sometimes you know you you know people say well lars is not the most technical drummer but the the thing is great drummers write great parts you know sometimes uh, yeah, there's two ways to go. You can concentrate on the technical ability and keep a straight beat or whatever, and that's. But then there's the, then there's a guy like Lars who really, obviously is you know co-writer, but he's really listening to 
to to what James is doing. And he's translating those guitar parts to the drums and orchestrating them. And I think that's what makes a great drummer uh, because some of those drum parts, I mean, uh, they're really inventive. You know, I, I happen to think he's a great drummer for that reason. And he's also a band leader that brought that band to, to incredible heights. So, um, man, I got nothing but respect for those guys, every one of them. And, and I knew Mike, uh, uh, Robert Trujillo, I had jammed with before, and he's a monster. You know, when he joined the band, it was like, okay, they got the right guy, you know. You jammed with him? When was that, Steve? In the 90s? Uh, a couple of different times. Um, huh. Yeah, um, before he was in Metallica, we jammed at, uh, we had a little rehearsal place in the valley, and he came by and jammed. And then he produced uh, that film documentary on Jaco Pistorius, the jazz bass player. And he asked me to play in the band at the premiere of that. I don't remember what we played, uh, but that was another example of, uh, of um, another, another time that I jammed with him. That's killer. Yeah, it's the 30th anniversary of the Black Album as well. I was just yeah. in Louisville and got that. Uh, do you like Sad But True in those songs, Wherever I May Roam on the Black Record when it came out? I, you know, at that time, um, the producer that did that record, Bob Rock, I bought every book. I didn't care who the artist was. I, I'd buy a Bob Rock record because they're state of the art. Yeah. You know, uh, yeah. the, the cult Sonic Temple and uh, uh, Dr. Feelgood. I mean, those records that Bob made and the ones that he engineered were state of the art. I mean, even, you know, um, and, and Bruce Fairburn, all of the guys that came out of Vancouver and that Little Mountain Studios. Um, you know, I think one of the early things Bruce Fairburn did was Loverboy. And, you know, say what you want about Loverboy or whatever, but that record sounds incredible i mean it was a great rock record is that the, me, don't yeah, want to lose your love tonight you know that song uh oh no that's uh outfield or something um, no they did uh turn me loose and you know <laughs> had a couple couple of hits but the records themselves you know are state of the me. art yeah really yeah, great, great really great so um yeah i i mean i knew the the you know um the previous record, the previous Metallica record, but when Black Album came out, it was just sounded, it just kicked the shit out of every other rock record, every <laughs> other, certainly every other metal record, you know? Yes, yes. I've got some blisters built over from just the, the weight of that record, just bring yeah. um, We're talking about Metallica in closing. I just want to show you something, Steve. Uh, little ornament here. But uh, this is a knuckle bones of right. James Hetfield and just the detail that they give to James. Everything. It's just it's so cool. You know, and those are those are painted by hand. Those are all the I didn't know that. I thought they just like got stamped out of it. But yeah, those are hand done. Yeah. Yeah. And you got your own knuckle bones action figure coming up here soon. That's pretty badass, man. Yeah, I can retire now, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, we're going to get you up on the mantelpiece, man, up there. And uh, did you pick a picture of yourself and submit it to Knuckle Bones or they just grabbed something that they saw online or? Um, well, it's a, it's a part of a set uh, with Billy and the, the, yeah. the, 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 they captured exactly what we were wearing and what that, and that phase uh, from the Rebel Yell video. Um, so it's, uh, yeah. That would have been 1983, I think. So, um, yeah, I think that's, you know, that's one of the most I iconic uh, images for us is, is that Rebel Yell video. And we, we wore that, that the, the, those clothes, we wore them the whole tour, never washed them. But never washed them, huh? <laughs> They're all leather. Oh. You know, we're f we were living in New York and somebody brought up the word spandex. And I think we... We threw them out of the room and they said, we're from fucking New York. We don't wear spandex. That's, <laughs> that's for L.A. guys, you know, because yeah. we wore leather. You know, that was the whole thing. And you didn't Never wash it. You, know, yeah. you didn't wash it. <laughs> you know? Right. <laughs> you still had those artifacts in your back closet at all? or I don't. I don't. Mm. I don't uh, you know, okay. um, I don't know. I, um, 
there's not too many things that I that I hold on to is, you know, there's certain things that I have, uh, items of that my dad, you know, things that are, are spiritually important to me, um, things that my dad owned or my grandfather owned. Uh, I have those. I have like a little shrine. And I, you know, I'm very, um, my wife and I are very into like honoring our ancestors and we, we thank them for everything that they gave us. And I firmly believe that that anything that I've achieved is the result of what my grandfather instilled in my family. He came over as a as an immigrant and brought the family over on the boat. And he loved music, and he was the first. You know, I think I could barely play two two chords, and he we, we would have these family gatherings, and he put me up on a table and play play your guitar. You know, um, he encouraged me to perform and. He had this this incredible enthusiasm for life and music, and he used to love to go to the to the uh, to the gospel churches just to hear them sing, and you know he just loved loved life, and um, so I believe in honoring these these people in your life, and so I don't I, those are things I cherish. I don't cherish you know clothes or things that um, you know I sold uh, the guitar that I played on Rebel Yell to a museum quite a number of years ago. Um, and, uh, and I've donated instruments and things like that. So um, uh, answer to your question, no, I don't have that stuff. All right. I mean, between, between your buddy Morales and, and your, your late father, you really have a great foundation uh, and it shows. And it's, uh, re it really means a lot that you came and joined me. Thank you very much, Steve. Oh, and thank you for, for um, bringing awareness to mental health um, and call on me if you need anything, you know, uh, you know, anything at all. Um, um, you, you know how to get, get a hold of me and uh, consider whatever you ask for concerning that uh, uh, done deal. More than happy to help out. Kent is a very good man. He's been very easy to work with your buddy there. And, and thank you very much. Just last comment here. Uh, my first date with my fiance, Ashlyn, was three years ago. Elton John came through Buffalo. And, you know, we're, we had a good time. Wrote two. All right, cool. So we came right back to this very room. And what movie we put on? Top Gun. Oh, and it wow. was maybe something in your strumming on the theme song that, hey, uh, <laughs> it, off we went. So <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. I just had to Great. squeeze that in there. So. Uh, Happy to be of service. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. So Billy Idol, uh, hitting back the road next year with the Go Go's in the UK in 2022. Uh, yeah, yeah. And uh, we're actually in Vegas at the Cosmopolitan for a, a residency in October this in, month. Yeah, a couple of couple of weeks. Yeah. Have a blast. Have a blast. Thank you. Yeah. So the Roadside EP, it's got that killer song, Bitter Taste, of the other few songs. Uh, I'll include a link below to the entire EP. But Great. Uh, next week is my very first WWE superstar to our viewers, uh, Al Snow. So that's, <laughs> that's going to be a nice little chat. So again, hit a subscribe, like if you enjoyed what you saw. Stay happy, stay healthy, stay hungry, stay happy. <laughs> right on. We'll Thank you, man. Okay, bye-bye.